So by this point, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know, the most difficult sermons for me to prepare are the topical ones. I don't like preaching topically. It's just hard for me to do that. I just like having the Word of God guiding where we go next, and we just do our best to break down the Scripture. Uh, but these topical ones are always a challenge. Uh, the most recent one would, of course, be Mother's Day, right? These special days of the year, Mother's Day. And oh, by the way, Happy Father's Day to everyone here today. All of the dads, Living Water Church dads, Happy Father's Day. And that being said, today is another one of them, right? Father's Day is always a challenging uh, sermon to prepare as well. One of the first things that I'll do, of course, is I'll go back to what I preached on last year. Now, we didn't actually have a, a Father's Day message specifically last year, I don't think, because I didn't see one. Um, but I always look back to a year ago, you know, for Mother's Day, the same thing, to see, just, you know, contextualize what, I, you know, what I sense maybe God wanting us to, to learn about this year, making sure I don't overlap too much from the previous year, even though, does anyone really remember what we talked about a year ago on this day? I'm not sure. Uh, but I always do that just to give me some context. And as I did that this week, something really stood out to me. How much and how quickly our nation has changed just since last year. What came to mind for me as I thought about that, honestly, was the second law of thermodynamics. I got a little scientific in that moment. Because as we know, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the natural tendency for any isolated system is for it to decay and degenerate over time, which is what we call entropy. And moreover, that the rate of entropy will increase as time goes on. That's an interesting thought. Because it seems that this is not only true in the scientific world, but spiritually as well, doesn't it? The increasing rate of decay in our society, that seems pretty descriptive of what we're seeing. And I know I'm not the only one in the room who sees this happening right before our very eyes. And it pains me to see how our nation is falling away from biblical values at an alarmingly rapid rate, perhaps faster than in any other time of history, which makes our celebration of Father's Day even more poignant and timely here in 2023. Because I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there will be a day, maybe in 15 years, 20 perhaps, when we no longer recognize Father's Day as a nation anymore. Perhaps gender and family identity will become so fluid and essentially meaningless that the entire concept of fatherhood could be on the verge of extinction. And while that can be a very scary reality that can create some fear and apprehension about what the future is going to look like, we turn once again today, church, to our authority, to our anchor, the Word of God, to reveal some very helpful, convicting perspective that speaks into this and gives us reason to stand firm in our peace, in our hope, in our trust in God, because God is in control. He always has been and always will be. But before we get into our passage, as you may have sensed already from this introduction, this is a heavy passage. To be honest, it was not on my radar at all in terms of what to preach on for Father's Day. I was looking at a few other options and really wanted to go there to one of those, but instead, I really believe the Holy Spirit, in faith, I believe the Holy Spirit really wanted us to hear what Romans 1 had to say today. So I approached this text with fear and trembling, and I hope that you will as well. If anything I share today is offensive to you, please know that this is not my heart nor my intention. I can only promise 
that everything spoken today is out of love and out of a sincere desire to declare the truth over you. God loves us. So he declares the truth to us and nothing but the truth. Because the most loving thing God can do for us and we could do for anyone else is to tell them the truth. So as heavy as this passage is, I'm deeply grateful that in his love for us, God desires for us to know the reality of where things are today as a nation. The reality of the bad news. So we can turn to him again in faith and receive and accept and embrace the good news of Jesus Christ again. And discover the true peace and freedom that is found in Jesus Christ alone. So let's go ahead and rise together in honor of God's word. And we're going to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And I invite you to read along in your hearts with me as I read our passage for us. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's be seated together. Well, there is no sugar coating here. As we begin with the reality, of God's wrath against mankind. Now, when you think about the wrath of God, what typically comes to mind is catastrophic judgment, right? Like the global flood of Noah's day, or even the, the cross of Jesus Christ, or the coming great tribulation, as told to us in the book of Revelation. That's what we think about when we think about God's wrath. But today, this passage reveals about how the wrath of God is revealed in a much more subtle way, but perhaps the most widespread. It's the curse of sin. And what's the cause of this form of his wrath? Why does God unleash his wrath in this way upon mankind? Verse 18 makes it clear, sorry. The ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. That is why the wrath of God has come. The ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There is no better description of our generation and really the heart of sinful man from the dawn of time than this. Sinful man is inclined always toward the flourishing of lies coupled with the rejection of truth. The flourishing of lies coupled with the rejection of truth. That's called suppressing the truth. That is what has led to the wrath of God being poured out on us even now. Brings to mind the line from the movie Jesus Revolution. The lies are loud, but the truth is quiet. The lies are loud, the truth is quiet. 
And that's what happens when a generation is lost. And that's where we are right now as a nation. That's where we are right now as a world. Lies are shouting at us every moment of every day. They're shouting at us on our phones. They're shouting at us on our commercials. They're shouting on us in our apps. They're shouting on us in our schools. On every level of society, the lies are getting loud. Lies, rather, are getting louder and louder. The lies are shouting at us in our government, our entertainment, our homes, every level of society. And when the truth tries to raise its voice, what happens? The lies get even louder to drown out the truth even more. Why is this happening? Who's behind this? Who's the mastermind of this? It's no surprise who it is. Jesus clearly told us who it is in John 8, verse 44. He said, he, the devil, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So it's no secret that when a nation or a people suppress the truth, silence the truth, and reject the truth, that generation is under the deceptive and deadly control of Satan. Father of lies. That's what's happening right now, church. Satan is laughing his heart out as our blinded, sinful society, in many of our own hearts, continue to buy in to the lies that we're hearing all the time. And what's the heart of all of these lies? What's really the core? It all comes down to one central reality which is this character and nature of God. That's where all the lies center around. And we're going to break this down here for the next few minutes. This is the great deception of our generation. The distorted stronghold the enemy has over the hearts of our society, over the hearts of sinful man. And I'm referring to this ultimate oxymoron, the ultimate irony. And that is this. What we are rejecting as a society is the only source of the hope for what we are seeking to embrace. In other words, everything our society is really seeking after is found only when God is at the center of it. Think about it. The key themes we constantly hear in society, acceptance, identity, Equality, the elimination of racism, the eradication of hate, a sense of purpose, meaning, hope, a second chance, and most of all, love. Love. We're always seeking after these things as a society, as a people. And yet, we're rejecting the very one who is the source of all of it. That's the ultimate deception the enemy has on our generation. I was preparing this message at a local Starbucks. And I don't usually do that anymore. I usually do prepare my messages at home. But we have some family in town and the house is a little, a little crazy right now. So I decided to go to a nice new Starbucks actually in Simi Valley right off the Stearns. Really nice, clean Starbucks there. And of course, as I walk in, the first thing I see are pride flags because it's June. It's pride. So Starbucks, like most Fortune 500 companies do during Pride Month, they show solidarity and support for the LGBTQIA plus community. Pretty much any store you go in, right? Uh, for the next month, any establishment you visit, You'll see messages posted everywhere. Messages saying something along, along the lines of, we promote and celebrate the equality and acceptance of all people. You'll, you'll see hashtag love is love, and you'll see that everywhere. 
I'm not making a statement on those messages. I'm simply asking the question, and I want us to think about this question. Anyone who is actually bigoted toward the LGBTQ community, will anyone like that even consider changing their minds about their hate and bigotry because of this messaging? Of course not. In fact, for the ones who actually need to hear that message, it might even make them more bigoted and hateful. I understand why these companies do this. But it really makes me look deeper inside and ask myself, where is all this headed? Do we really want more acceptance? Do we really want more love? Do we really want more grace as a society? Do we really want more equality? And are we getting it through this messaging? Are we getting it through these corporate marketing schemes that show acceptance? Are we really growing in these areas because of this? I don't know. But what I think is the only way for these things to be possible is through the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform the bigoted, hateful, sinful human heart. Because if we could just see one another through the eyes of God, then we would see beyond race. We would see beyond gender identity. We would see beyond sexual preference. We would see beyond pronouns. We would see beyond all the things that we are forced to come to grips, grips and terms with every moment of every day. We would see deeper and see beyond that and realize every single human being is made in the image of God. And that all of us are sinners who need a Savior. And at that point, no one is greater than anyone else. All of a sudden, we do accept each other. We embrace each other. We love each other. We even love our enemies because of the transforming power of the gospel. Not because of Pride Month or any corporate marketing scheme. What's the answer? Celebrity advocacy? Or is the answer deeper? Is the answer down to the heart? Brothers and sisters, God's word declares to us that the answer is Jesus Christ and the cross alone. And to this end, here again is the great deception of Satan. That the heart of the lies is the notion that God is the author of hate. That organized religion is to blame for the bigotry and violence we see in society. Isn't that what we're, what we're hearing? In our schools, in our philosophy classes, in the just secular humanism that just permeates every level of society. What we hear is that God is the problem. God is the author of hate. Organized religion is the reason why we got here, so we need to eradicate it. We need to get rid of it. I don't think there's any historical figure that has been more influential in this regard than the notable 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche who famously wrote this in a piece called The Parable of the Madman. This is when he took it. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we, murderers of all murderers, console ourselves? That which was the holiest and mightiest of all, that the world has yet possessed, has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe his blood off of us? 
With what water could we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we need to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? And here's what the question he asks in this parable. Must we not ourselves become gods simply to be worthy of it? This is where really secular humanism began. Nietzsche hints at the very heart of sinful man. The lowest common denominator to which every generation will descend upon and where we find ourselves in 2023 as a nation and a world. We have forgotten God and placed ourselves upon the throne as gods. Nothing has changed since the Garden of Eden. We still want to be like God. We still want to suppress the truth and define what is good and evil ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to get rid of God. We have to forget God, eliminate God from every level of society. God must remain dead. And here's what Romans 1, verses 19 and 20 makes clear. This is an active pursuit. We must actively kill God. We must actively ignore God. We must actively suppress the truth. Because that which is known about God is evident within us. For God made it evident to us. Not a single person, if you ask any random person today, if you ask them the question, who is God? Not a single person is going to say, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Is anyone going to say that? If you ask them, who is God? They're going to say, what? I have no idea what you mean by that. Of course they're not going to say that. They're going to give you probably some weird answer or perhaps an accurate answer. Or many of them might just say, well, I don't believe in God. But none of them will say, look, what do you mean, who is God? What are you talking about? Every person has an inherent sense of who God is. Every person does. And verse 20 tells us why. For the, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Look at that clay on words there. His invisible attributes have been clearly seen. How? Being understood through what has been made. Creation. God has been revealing his nature and power through the witness of creation since the dawn of time. We discussed this actually uh, maybe a month or two ago uh, during our, our youth gathering. And it was a very fascinating conversation. And I also mentioned it a few weeks ago in our Genesis 1 study, which is for me the existence of outer space is one example. The created order gives witness to the divine nature and power of God. So the outer space does that. You know, astronomy has been a subject of much interest to humanity for centuries. And I think part of the reason why is because outer space just fills us with a sense of awe and mystery because it reveals the divine nature and power of God in its infinite expanse. The awesome mystery of the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. Of course, God doesn't reveal the details about salvation through creation. Because that those details were too important to just reveal through creation. So what did God do there? He actually came to earth to reveal that to us through Jesus Christ. And God calls the church, of course, to go and make disciples of all nations. It's our responsibility to make Christ known to the world. But at the very core, God has revealed himself from the very beginning through creation. So all people are without excuse for ignoring the reality, the nature, and the existence of God. Let's break this down even more. What happens when we do not honor God? What happens when we instead seek to kill God, eliminate God, and the truth about God? 
the inevitable result is clear in verses 21 through 23. I want to break this down carefully here because this is really telling. This section here is really telling. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks. And that's where our generation is right now, right? But they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart is darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and animals and creatures. If we break these down, it reveals the fourfold byproducts of ignoring God. There's four things that happen. Number one, our reasoning becomes increasingly futile. In other words, our reasoning increasingly lacks in sensibility and wisdom. That's, that's one byproduct of suppressing truth. Our reasoning becomes lacks more and more in sensibility and wisdom. Secondly, our hearts get further darkened into foolishness. In other words, sin gets increasingly perverted. Third, we profess to be wise and enlightened, especially in comparison to having faith in God. And fourthly and lastly, we become increasingly idolatrous of the natural world. Okay, so let's, I'm going to just break these down for us so that we, we can really see clearly how these are lined up in this passage. Number one, our reasoning becomes increasingly futile, lacking in sensibility and wisdom. Our hearts get further darkened in foolishness. So sin gets increasingly perverted. Thirdly, we profess to be enlightened, especially in comparison with those who have faith in God, and lastly, we become increasingly idolatrous of the natural created world. Think about these four things. Are these not the very realities that we are witnessing in our world in increasing measure every single day? Now, we don't have time to get into the myriad of examples of this in society, but I am going to mention a few. And these things that I mentioned have become hotly political issues. But these are not political issues in and of themselves. So as I mentioned a few, I just invite you to look at these. Just think about these from the lens of sensibility. From the lens of sensibility, not from a political lens. Just from the lens of sensibility. We have biological men using women's restrooms on the basis of preference. Just think of it from a sensibility and wisdom standpoint. We have children in certain states who are allowed to have gender reassignment surgery to align their bodies to their perceived sense of what their gender is. Children. It's not a political statement. Just think of it from a sensibility standpoint. Biological men are competing in women's sports and breaking records. And when women speak out on it, they are silenced. Musical artist Sam Smith performed just a few months ago on primetime television for children to see. 2023 Grammy Awards, with the most overt mockery of God and the most overtly satanic song to ever hit the charts, and crowds were cheering. We seek with religious zeal to protect and preserve the climate and the environment. While we abort over a million human lives in and now outside of the womb, every single year in the United States alone. And the list goes on and on and on. How do we get to this point? Where did it all begin? 
It's when men suppress the truth. When we exchange the truth of God for a lie, it's when people want to be on the throne as gods. When a nation forgets God, falsehood becomes truth, and here we are. One more observation on this, which is what verse 24 reveals is the ultimate sign. The ultimate sign of a lost idolatrous generation. Therefore, God gave them over the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Some of us may have wondered why the transgender movement has become so celebrated and so highlighted in our society. And why now? But that really shouldn't be a surprise to any of us because it's exactly what God's word has revealed all along. That when a people forget God, our concept and expressions of human sexuality inevitably, inevitably become more deviant and distorted. It happens all the time. The devil has been using perversion of human sexuality as one of his greatest weapons since the dawn of humanity. 2018 study in Psychology Today, the secular journal Psychology Today, found that 98% of men surveyed between the ages of 18 and 35 years old, 98% of men reported regular usage of pornography on the internet. 98% of men. And it was in the 70 percentile for women as well. And even this secular article noted some of the destructive effects of this on relationships, on marriage, on many things. Sexual immorality in its various forms has been an issue addressed by Scripture from the very opening pages of Genesis. And the scariest part about this is that God is not unaware of this. Nor is he removed from the equation. But verse 24 states that he actively gives them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. In other words, distortion of the expressions of human sexuality are a form of God's wrath and judgment. When we suppress the truth, God doesn't force the truth on anyone, but will actually let them continue to spiral further into their rebellion and into their rejection of truth as wrath is stored up against them. By this point, I want to thank everyone who's still sitting here listening to this. Like I said, for me, this was not my number one choice to preach on for Father's Day. But I felt compelled that this is what we needed to hear. But let me pivot at this point. This is a heavy passage. God isn't sugarcoating the truth. But again, he's telling us the truth because of his love for us. God is merciful. Yes, he is the judge, and yes, he is holy, but he is merciful. And Jesus Christ is our only hope, and his arms are open wide to every single one of us. Jesus is our hope as a people, as a church, as a nation. See, the enemy wants us to look within and just keep listening to the messaging out there that says everything about us is inherently good. Celebrate who you are. You don't have to do anything. The problem is with everyone else. Let's remove God from the equation. God's the author of hate. God's the author of judgment. Let's just get him out of the equation. We don't have to listen to that messaging. The louder the messaging is, the more you need to be skeptical of it. 
we will not exchange the truth of God for a lie. We must instead stand firm in embracing and declaring the truth in our generation. Now more than ever, church, we need to remember that the father in the story of the prodigal son is God. That's him. That's who he's always been. That's who he is today. He is still the God who runs after his children who don't deserve his love. He's still the God who runs after his children who have messed up, who have done everything possible to disqualify ourselves. He still runs after those who have done everything in our power to run away from him. He still runs to those who are guilty of suppressing the truth. God is running after us, church, with his arms open wide because that's the kind of God he is. He is a God of grace, a God of second chances, a God of restoration, a God of healing, a God who embraces us, a God who doesn't hide the truth from us because he wants us to realize the only way to find ourselves is to lose ourselves in Christ. And on this Father's Day, I believe God is calling all fathers and husbands to rise up and to be the ones to show our families, our wives, our children, the heart of the Father like never before. To rise up and be men of God who will honor the truth of God's word, cling to the truth as our greatest treasure, declare the truth through our lives. We must take the lead as a spiritual head of our household, being the shepherd who cares not just for the education or the well, physical well-being of our children, but shepherds who will be praying over our spouse and our children, shepherds who will be guiding our spouse and our children, encouraging them to keep their eyes on Jesus Men of God must be vigilant to guard our hearts and our minds against any forms of sexual immorality. Honoring our wives by keeping the marriage bed pure. Fulfilling the emotional, physical and spiritual needs of our wives. Loving them as Christ loves his bride. And doing all we can to help our children understand the importance of guarding their hearts and minds from the destructive effects of pornography and sexual perversion and sexual sin. You know, some of our children have already been broken by those things. To be the shepherd, to support them unto restoration and healing. Brothers, I want to remind us of the words of the prophet Micah. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The heart of spiritual leadership is humility and grace. Not demanding respect, being overbearing and removed, like some of our fathers were to us growing up. Is that the model of the heart of God for our families? Absolutely not. We will embrace what God's word teaches us about what it means to be a man of God, a husband of God, and a father who honors Christ. Humility means trusting in God alone, not in ourselves. Clinging to the truth. Humility means finding our joy and purpose in Christ and not trying to make a name for ourselves. In fact, I want to do this. I want to ask every husband and every father in the room to stand. Will you stand right now? Every husband and father, I want to invite you to stand right now. How about every man of God stands here?
If you're not a husband and father, it's okay. Every man of God. In faith, brothers, I believe this is the word from the Lord, not from me. You are a soldier of the army of God in this generation. You are a soldier of the army of God in this generation. And if you don't fight the good fight of faith and truth for your loved ones, for your family, nobody else will. God has given you the mantle and the responsibility and the power to be the soldier of the army of God over your family. Never accept defeat. Never give up. Never think it's too late. Never think you're too far from God to fulfill this. You're not too far from God because in fact God's running after you. He's a lot closer than you think. Stand your ground in the truth so that the generation to follow you may be the remnant who will take that mantle and stand firm in the truth for the purpose of God in their generation. Just as you serve the purpose of God in yours.